But I, I was curious maybe what my first social media posts were when I came on Facebook. So I joined Facebook in 2011, um, and out of all the things I could have posted, thankfully my heart was in the right place, and you'll see my first Facebook post ever. Uh, October 4th, 2011, I posted, Packers are 4-0, no one can stop them now. Um, I'm a diehard Packers fan. I, this proves I was never a bandwagoner, I've been a Packers fan my whole life. Um, Packers did end up getting stopped, sadly, that year, but there's suffice to say, uh, my heart was in the right place in my first social media post. Um, I, what's weird is that someone's asking for my green math sheet uh, right below that, but, uh, so you can see kind of like where my heart was in my first post. I started looking at Instagram and thinking through, I joined Instagram probably in 2013. My parents said I was not allowed to have one. So when it came out in 2011, I had to get the guts and the courage to uh, make an Instagram account behind my parents' back. Uh, so in 2013, of all the angsty things I could have posted uh, in rebelling against my parents, this is what I ended up posting. <laughs> out of all of history's monsters, you're by far the most evil thing I've ever encountered. <laughs> Gunther the Penguin from uh, Adventure Time. Um, so clearly, I was a meme lord ever since 2013. Um, apparently, I was a really big Adventure Time fan. I, I don't know why, but that was the one thing of all things I could have posted. Um, we all have these old cringy Facebook or Instagram posts, I'm sure, as you look back through your social media. I just had to ask, like, I wonder what my wife was posting when she like, got her first account. So I looked at her first uh, Facebook uh, post. On October 21st, 2011, my wife posted, going to dinner. <laughs> Wow, riveting. Um, <laughs> crazy stuff happening in Hannah's house that night. Uh, I don't know what's sadder, the post itself, or the fact that no one even asked what was for dinner. Um, but apparently she won 2-0 and got a like after. That's great. Um, so she won 2-0 the next day, which is great. Um, so whether you've had social media your whole life, whether you had social media for years, or whether you have sworn off social media, we can't deny that all of us have had some sort of interaction with social media in our lives. And social media shapes so much of our world today, especially when you consider that Facebook has 3.07 billion active users on a monthly basis. 3.07 billion people in a world of, I don't know, seven, eight billion. Uh, Instagram has 2.4 billion active users. Social media has a huge impact on our lives. It's undeniable that it shapes so much of the world around us. What's crazier is that there's statistics out there that for young adults ages 18 to 35, so a little bigger than the window we have here, uh, for young adults ages 18 to 35, they spend approximately seven and a half hours of their day on a screen. So they have seven and a half hours each day of screen time. And 2022, it was reported that the average person spends two hours, 22 minutes on social media each day. Which, that's for all people, so I can only imagine for young adults, it's probably even a little bit higher than that. So it's undeniable. Technology and social media have a huge presence in our lives. And it can't be ignored as we consider our discipleship to Jesus Christ. In a world that is digitized, in a world that is technologically based, where everyone is on social media, we have to really consider what does it mean for us to be faithful and living out our discipleship day in and day out on this thing where the world gets to see what we're posting. As we look and see how the world uses social media today, I, I think I see a lot of trends as I look through what people are posting, as I look through kind of like what young adults are going through in this stage. I think it goes without saying that many people who are posting on social media and all that kind of stuff, they, it kind of feeds this sense of validation or approval. We have this like culture uh, where we post something on Instagram, we post something on Facebook, and we actually are paying attention to how many likes we get. We, we feel the sense of validation. We get this rush when we get a like. Uh, there's actually science that shows that getting likes on social media uh, gives our brains this hit of dopamine, which dopamine is that chemical in our brains where when something pleasurable happens in our lives, when we eat a good meal, when we uh, are having sex, when we're uh, like doing drugs, there's this hit of dopamine, this crazy thing that happens in our brain that it excites us. Uh, it's this same hormone that gets released when there's a like on your social media, which is crazy. Uh, it gives us this sense of self-worth and approval, but also it creates this dependency where we actually see our self-worth based on how many likes we're getting, where we think that our sense of value can almost come from how many likes we get, and just shows how dangerous this can be. We crave it, and when we're in too deep, this can heavily damage where we're at, it can heavily damage our mental health and things like that. There's this sense of groupthink with social media, we tend to follow the people we like and agree with. And if someone says something we don't like, we just unfollow them. We pretend they don't exist. We just block them off our page. This leads to this confirmation bias, right? Where we're not only being exposed to beliefs that we agree with, but we're entrenching those beliefs even more. 
which maybe is a good thing when it's like good, solid, truth-based beliefs, but when it's just opinions being reinforced over and over again, and we're not exposing ourselves to the perspectives of others, it can just entrench those opinions and make us think they're fact when they're not. And this is just enforced by the algorithm uh, with any kind of social media app. It literally is seeing what you're liking and trying to show you more of it. And sometimes this can be relatively harmless. Uh, like my wife follows all sorts of Amazon influencers to see what kind of new clothes she can get. Or for me, I like follow random meme accounts and stuff like that. Um, and this can be harmful when we're not, uh, you know, this can be harmless when we're, you know, just having fun. But at the end of the day, when we're not being exposed to the perspectives of those around us, it can tend to isolate ourselves intellectually and to think that we're always right about things. I'm sure many of you who've been interacting with social media for years have seen just the anger that can come out in social media, the bitterness, the wrath. Uh, I'm convinced that one of the most toxic things on social media is fan accounts. As you saw, I was a Packers fan. Uh, I still am a Packers fan. I follow like Packers fan pages. Uh, that's one of my like things. Uh, but if anyone says like an unpopular opinion on any kind of social media site, people are going to attack them. People are going to say like, how could you think that? How could you say that? That's stupid. This is crazy. They start cussing each other out. And it's just like so much unnecessary hate for people you've never met face to face. Um, and this is just over a football team. We see this all the time. We see uh, with actors and social media, whenever something happens in a movie that we don't like, people are criticizing it. When things happen in a TV show that we don't like, we criticize it. There's actors who get death threats for how they act in a movie. This is so prevalent that we even have segments in TV shows like Jimmy Kimmel called Reading Mean Tweets. Right? We see that this is such a prevalent thing where we know that this toxicity is in social media today. One of the extremes of this could be cancel culture, where if someone says one unpopular thing, their entire career or livelihood could be ruined. And sometimes it is something terrible. Something, sometimes it's things that are truly awful, but sometimes it could be something small or meaningless. And yet for one mistake, they could be completely canceled in their careers. Uh, there's this sense of comparison that comes from social media. One of our natural tendencies when looking at different people's posts, different people's accounts, is to compare our lives to theirs. When we see these highlight reels from other people's lives, we can't help but think, like, Man, I wish I had that thing. I wish I looked like that. I wish I could go on this vacation. I wish my family looked like that. Whatever it might be, we all have these like, temptations to just compare ourselves to others. For my wife, she's a kindergarten teacher. One of the biggest ways this comes out is through this like, teacher envy. She, show, she follows all these like, t kindergarten teacher accounts, and as soon as she sees like, the newest thing, like the newest way of teaching the kids, the newest like, thing to have in the classroom, she gets super jealous. She was like, oh, I really want that. But at the end of the day, like, no kid's really paying attention. They don't, they're not going to remember like, what these things are. Um, but for others of us, we may feel this sense of FOMO, this fear of missing out when we see people doing the things we want to do or inviting our friends and wishing we were invited too. For others of us, social media may be a coping mechanism. Raise your hand if you've ever had a time when you've walked into a room and didn't really know what to do. You fell on comfy, so you pulled out your phone. That's all I got. I think most of you are lying if you're not raising your hand. Whether you're going in, walking in a line at Starbucks and you're just going to pop on your phone. Maybe you come to young adults and don't see your friends yet, you probably pop on your phone. Uh, whatever it might be, we often get in these situations where when we feel uncomfortable, our natural instincts just go on our phone, just kind of tune out until we feel more familiar with those around us. Uh, it, this happens all the time in our lives. Maybe even with your family or your friends at the dinner table, if there's one little moment of awkward silence, it just gives you the excuse to check out. It even it influences our attention span where we have moments where we get so used to these little sound bites, these quick hits of information from a 30 second TikTok video that it makes it hard for us to even pay attention to anything longer than that. And all of these aspects of social media can lead us to two extremes. I think it can lead us to this place where we either love social media and we end up almost getting like addicted to this feeling and this rush of trying to get involved in this other world, or we just try to cancel it out altogether. We try to like block our social media, we choose to delete it, whatever it might be. Some countries like Australia have actually even proposed putting age limits on uh, social media sites like Instagram or Facebook because of the mental and physical health tolls that it has on children. And so with all this, this sounds super negative. I know what you think. You're like, okay, boomer. Like, this is crazy. Like, this is your, like, you sound like my parents, like, telling me to get off Instagram. Like, this is, like, too much. And honestly, let's be real. Social media isn't all evil. There are good parts of social media. There are great things that come from it. We have a social media account for young adults. We don't try to hide that. Uh, I have a personal Instagram account. I have a personal Facebook account. Like, it isn't an inherently bad thing. But at the same time, how we engage with social media actually really matters for us as Christians. And how we engage with it actually serves as a testament to the transformation that God has brought in our lives. 
So before we dive into what uh, biblical advice can we learn of how to have a transformed view of how we engage with social media, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, I just thank you for the chance to all be here together. I, I thank you for the chance to just explore what it means to be faithful to you in all things, how to have a transformed view in our lives and our discipleships of what it means for us to interact, engage with, and consume social media. What does it look like for us to be faithful to you? God, we are just thankful that uh, your word does not hide this from us. God, that your word is truth and it brings light to, and advice on how we can be faithful to you in these things. So help us to learn today. Help us to learn from your word. Holy Spirit, speak through me in this time. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we consider how God's word maybe impacts the way as we engage with social media, one of the first things that stands out to me is that we need to guard against comparison. As we said earlier, comparison is such an easy tendency when we look and see these social media posts and we're comparing ourselves to those around us, we have to remember not to compare ourselves to others. In fact, scripture kind of has two commands that really stand out to me that we should not covet and we should not envy. Exodus 20.17 will be up on the screen. And in this, Exodus 20.17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So as we look to the Old Testament and the history of the Israelite people, this command in Scripture is known as one of the Ten Commandments, which is probably one of the most well-known, famous moments in Scripture, where God rescues the people of Israel, brings them out of slavery in Egypt, brings them to Mount Sinai, and God is sharing the law with Moses, who's going to be a representative to him to share with the people of Israel, God's covenant people. And the law was basically intended to be uh, not just a set of rules and regulations, but really a way that Israel could show day in and day out, hey, this is what it looks like for us to be a transformed people by God. This is what it looks like for us to be God's chosen people. And so this law was able to ex help them express what it means to be a part of God's covenant people. The covenant was not just a law, but an expectation for Israel's relationship with God. And so in the last of these Ten Commandments, we see the people of Israel are urged not to covet. And since we don't really use that word covet today, I think it might be helpful to take some time to understand what that means. And this command to not covet doesn't just mean that we're not allowed to want things. Like, it's okay for us to want things. It's okay for us to have desires. But we should never let those desires, those feelings, those wants ever get in the way of our relationship with God. It should never come out in a way where we are wanting to take something from someone else. Uh, the, this command to not covet does not mean that we shouldn't want things, but instead this verse shows that uh, we should not be desiring or longing for something that is not our own, something that belongs to someone else. Uh, this verse shows that it extends to anything imaginable, whether it's possessions or relationships. It talks about not coveting someone else's wife, someone's servant, someone's ox, someone's things. Because ultimately coveting leads us away from contentment in what God has given us. And it leads this unhealthy desire for what others have. In fact, this commandment to not covet is often tied uh, with another commandment to not steal. Uh, because often when our, we're coveting, when we're desiring things that belong to someone else, we become so consumed by it, we become so obsessed with what they have and wishing it was our own that we almost want to take it for ourselves. Whether we act on it or not, it has this thought in mind, like, I just wish that was mine. I wish I had what you have. This is similar to envy, uh, where in passages like Proverbs 14.30, it says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh but envy makes the bones rot. Envy literally tears us apart as we compare ourselves to others and get jealous of what they have. It literally consumes us. Like we can't help but think about it. We just want this thing. And the reality of social media is that it's often a highlight reel. When we look at social media, things often aren't as good as they seem. So much is edited. So much is filtered. We shouldn't be chasing after someone else's life. At the end of the day, we need to be living out the life that God has called us to and not being so consumed with what others around us are doing. We need to be, stop being so obsessed with someone else's highlight reel, not realizing that they're going through things in their own lives as well. In addition to guarding against comparison, we also need to be uplifting with the words we speak. We need to be careful not to be giving into the ways of this world and giving into anger, hate, viciousness, and wrath. Instead, be uplifting and sharing kindness and grace with one another. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, uh, in this passage of scripture, Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. 
Now, this passage is rooted in this idea of how believers ought to treat one another in the church. This is a message rooted to the church and how they're supposed to treat one another as fellow believers. But isn't this a beautiful picture of how we can live in this world compared to the anger and viciousness we see all around us? Instead of being known for bitterness, anger, wrath, and slander, we need to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. These words Paul uses indicates almost like a progression that where our bitterness turns into anger, which turns into slander, and which turns into malice. We see this all the time in social media comments, like I was saying, where we see this bitterness turn into rage, where all of a sudden when someone disagrees with us, when someone has an unpopular opinion, it, we get so mad about it, we get so worked up, where we start to see this person as other where we start to want to distance ourselves from them because of this opinion that they have. And we almost get entertained by it. We look at, like, I for one have looked through, like, the comments on, like, a YouTube video or an Instagram post or whatever and be like, this is just crazy. Like, look at this. This is wild. But at the end of the day, like, what does that say about us when we're just watching this for entertainment or trying to contribute to this? What's crazy is that Paul says this kind of behavior actually grieves the Holy Spirit in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. It is showing that God is actually grieved when people who are meant to be mirrors of his love act in this way of wrath towards others. The image in Greek with this word for put away in verse 31, where uh, let clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. It, it reminds us of a few verses earlier in verse 22 when Paul says we need to take off the old self. I mean, we need to live into this new calling that Christ has had for us. And that means we need to literally take off. We need to put away the ways of this world. We need to take off the things of this world that, that remind us of just the viciousness, the wrath, and the anger that we had before. Instead, we need to be living into God's grace. This love that Paul talks about is rooted in something this world will never understand. And that's the forgiveness that Christ has for us. Where even when we didn't deserve it, even when we messed up, even in all of our rebellion and sin against God, God chose to forgive us and to send his son on the cross to die for us. He not only forgave us, but allowed us to be reconciled to himself through Jesus Christ that we may be in a relationship with him. And this is what ought to fuel our kindness and love towards others. Whether they deserve it or not, we're meant to embody the love of our creator when we're forgiving and uplifting towards those around us, whether we agree with them or not. Whether they're saying something that makes sense or not, whether they're saying truth or not, we can still act in love. We can still speak the truth in love. And so we've seen that we should not be comparing ourselves to one another, and we need to be uplifting towards each other. But in Scripture, we also see that we should be slow to judge others' decisions regarding social media. Everyone has opinions on how other people should uh, use social media accounts. Some people think that social media is this terrible thing. It needs to be deleted. You should never be on it. Other people think social media is super fun, and there's no issues with it. Some people want to be influencers. Other people think this is crazy. Like, don't even try it. And my wife uh, follows like families with kids, like the bucket list family. Uh, and some people have major concerns though about like, should you be showing your kids on social media or not? Should you be showing your kids in these videos? And I'm not saying any of these things are inherently good or bad, or that one way is better than another. That's not my decision to make. Uh, yet. For me, I've seen this in my own life. A few years ago, one of my best friends uh, and his wife decided to make a travel influencer account. And I'm going to be totally honest. They made this travel account. They're starting off, and it was just so cringy. It was hard to watch. Uh, it was one of my best friends from college. He was my roommate. And I'm watching them make these videos. They're acting totally different. They're trying to like promote this stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is never going to take off. Um, this hurts to watch. Uh, but as time went on, and literally as years went on, they got more and more viewers to the point where now they're traveling to all sorts of places. They're going to these crazy parts of the world. Uh, and his wife was able to literally quit her job in order to be a full-time content creator, which is literally like the dream. Uh, and just last year, they gave me and my wife a call. And they're like, hey, like, how's it going? Like, we just we're wondering if you want to go to Bora Bora with us for a week. Um, not paying for us, but like we just want to go to Bora Bora. We're going to do it, make some travel videos. You want to come? I'm like, wow, I chose the wrong profession. Just kidding. Um, I was like, wow, that is insane that you were able to do this kind of stuff. And when a few years ago, I was like making fun of this. And now I'm like, wow, that this, there is money in this apparently. Uh, my fear is that we can easily become legalistic, where we can easily look at what other people are doing and start to act condescendingly towards each other where we can see how someone else is using social media and think, gosh, how could you be doing this? This is like a terrible idea. This is not God honoring. When in reality, some things are just okay. Like some things don't necessarily lead uh, towards something that is taking them away from God. Paul addresses these areas of liberty in our lives in Romans 14, 13 through 14. In this passage, Paul says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. 
I know and am persuaded that nothing is unclean in itself, but is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. So the context helps here. In this passage, Paul is talking about food that was considered clean or unclean within Jewish culture. So Paul's writing to these Jews spread across the Roman Empire, and he's talking about how through Christ's work on the cross, all these Jewish food laws and customs in the Jewish religion were put aside, where Christ basically atoned for that. That was no longer a part of what it means for us to have to be a Christian today. And yet there were some people who were still ethnically Jewish Christians uh, who felt convinced to follow those laws. And Paul's basically saying here, like, that is totally okay. If you feel convicted to keep doing this, you can keep doing that. This rule just can't be imposed on others. This is something that is not a command from God's word any longer. And so we do not need to impose this rule on others. But also for those of us who didn't believe in that, uh, we shouldn't be trying to pressure or force them into abandoning those practices. He's arguing that by doing that, we're putting up this stumbling block, which could actually hinder them from falling through in their faith in Christ. So what Paul's getting at here is we need to be careful about not making any kind of rules or think of ourselves as being holier than thou art for living our faith in God in different ways. Now, don't mistake Paul here. That doesn't mean that we can do anything we want. We're not free to do anything in this life. Instead, when there are areas that are gray areas, there's this liberty. We have this freedom to live our faith in different ways as long as that action is not actually drawing us away from the Lord. But if someone actually is sinning, if someone is doing something that is leading them to go further into sin and further in separating themselves from the Lord, we are called to actually encourage our brothers and sisters to turn back to Christ and away from sinful actions. So in terms of social media, some of us may be convinced that, you know, social media is awful and wrong. You need to delete it. And some of us may be like, there's no issue with this. Like, it's fine. As long as your decision isn't actually leading you into sin, we should be slow to judge or accuse others. We should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry. And yet, as we talk about sin, we need to be mindful of the content that's on our social media. When I say mindful, I don't mean cutesy or demure. I mean that as Christians, we need to be mindful of whether the content we're posting and consuming is actually honoring to God or not. We need to be mindful of what we're posting and how this is actually reflecting our lives as Christians, as followers of Christ. Because the reality is many of us in this room may not be using social media in a way that's honoring to God. Everything we post is seen by a watching world. This world is watching us. They know we're supposed to be living differently. They know we're supposed to be living in accordance with the gospel. And so the way we interact with social media actually impacts and actually has an influence on those around us. And we need to really think about why are we posting the things we're posting sometimes? Or why are we watching certain things? If you're sharing this revealing photo of yourself to update your followers, are you actually trying to update your followers? Or are you wanting people to notice and comment on the way you look? You know, are, are you posting about a controversial topic to actually educate others? Or are you just trying to put others down and start an argument? It's not just about what we post, but also what we consume, what we're looking at. I, I want to challenge you to think about who you're following and why you're following them. Why are you actually following people or liking photos that are being shared of these revealing photos of others? Could it be feeding into your own lust? Could it be feeding into your own temptation or causing you to stumble? Are the memes you're looking at actually appropriate and God-honoring? Is this something that's actually uplifting? Is your language on social media actually honoring God? Are the things you're looking at leading you to feel shame or comparison in your life? Instead of filling our minds with these things of the world, instead of filling our mind and our time with things that don't honor God, Philippians 4.8 reminds us that whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellent or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Ultimately, Scripture is reminding us that the, the things we think about ultimately influence our behaviors and our actions and our beliefs. The content we create and consume actually shapes and affects our minds more than we like to admit. So be sure you're considering who you're following and what you're looking at and what you're posting. Because like I said, the world is watching. And this is affecting our discipleship, whether we realize it or not. But at the end of the day, whether you choose to use social media or not, one last thing we learn from Scripture is that social media will never satisfy our need for community. No matter how uh, connected we feel like we are with social media, it will never satisfy the craving we have to be in a community of people who love us, who care for us, and point us toward our purpose and what really matters in life. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the end drawing, the day drawing near. The author of Hebrews is speaking to the church, encouraging them, but by meeting together, uh, this is essential in their pursuit of Christ. By meeting together, we actually encourage each other as we try to be faithful in living out our faith in a world that is full of hardness, of suffering, of pain, in a world where it's hard to be faithful to Christ. We get to be encouraging to one another. When we don't have this community around us, it's hard to remain faithful. It's hard to remain faithful in the midst of challenges and hardships. And yet gathering together as the body of Christ actually allows us to be honest with our struggles. It allows us to encourage and learn from each other and have a consistent space to remind each other of God's truth. You know, social media comes with this kind of implicit promise that can, by connecting the world through social media, we're more connected than we've ever been before in the history of mankind. We, connect, we can connect with anyone in any part of the world at any time. I know even just the other day, we uh, shared our Instagram post where we uh, had our gender reveal. We found out we're having a little girl. Um, and we're looking through, people are commenting. And my wife was like, who's this TOEF guy who commented? And I was like, babe, you mean TOEF from my, my uh, mission trip to the Philippines 11 years ago? Like, no way. Um, like, we get to be connected with these people across the world. We get to stay connected with people like the, the Torna family, who's one of our global partners in Indonesia, in a way we wouldn't be able to without social media. Uh, I'm able to play Fortnite with my buddies whenever I want, uh, no matter where we are. You know, we are able to stay connected in super cool ways. Um, yet, studies have consistently shown that even though we are more connected than ever in this day and age, many of us are going to feel way more isolated and way more alone than we ever have before. Last year, there was this bombshell report from the U.S. Surgeon General claiming that there's been a loneliness endemic in our country, where despite all the methods of connection that we have, people still feel more lonely now than they ever have in the history of mankind. Another report from the CDC said that 73% of Gen Zers, which is most of us in this room, feel lonely either sometimes or always. When technology begins to replace our daily interactions face-to-face -face with other people, we start to feel this isolation. We start to feel alone. We start to feel disconnected. We start to feel the weight of just the struggles of this life without having the people around us to support us. And I'm not saying this is solely because of social media use. Like we said, it's, a, it's not like social media is the root of all of this per se, but it's undeniable that in a digital age, it's having some impact on our lives. Social media is contributing in some way to this loneliness we're feeling. And this doesn't mean that we should just disconnect and go off the grid. I'm not saying that you should delete your social media accounts. But for some of you, maybe you should. Maybe for some of you, that actually is something that is causing you to stumble. It's causing you to struggle in your lives. And so as you consider what does it mean to be faithful in how you use social media, be, be wise. Consider, is this actually something that's helping me grow in my discipleship? Is this a healthy distraction? Or is this something that's actually causing me to stumble more? And yet, as we consider what we do with social media, we cannot forget that at the end of the day, we need to be plugged into community, and our community is found in the church. As the church, we forget that we are meant to be the hope of the world, that Jesus Christ has empowered us as the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit to be faithful to him in all things, that we are meant to be a beacon of hope and light and truth in this world. And in a world that doesn't know Christ, we're meant to be a completely different community where people can feel connected, where people can experience genuine fellowship and can feel the love and purpose that comes from knowing Christ and Christ alone. Yeah, so as we wrap up, I hope this reminds you of our need to be a community that avoids envying one another. Our calling to be a people that are known for kindness, a community that's not quick to judge or accuse, yet a community that's mindful of the content we consume and share and a community that does not neglect meeting with each other. And while this message is focused on social media, I recognize there's probably many of you who maybe feel like you're not struggling with this topic. Many of you hopefully do have healthy boundaries with social media. However, maybe even if you don't struggle with social media, maybe it's technology in general, or video games, or whatever it might be that you feel like is distracting you from your relationship with the Lord. And so use your time wisely. As the passage earlier says, the end is drawing near. We know that the day is drawing near where Christ will return. We know that this life will not last forever and the time we have matters. And so be wise with the time that you're using. Make sure you're giving God the first fruits of your time. And regardless, that my prayer is that we are a community uh, who does not just engage with technology in a way that mirrors this world or that's passive, but that we seek to honor God in our social media usage. 
Uh, lastly, the reality is that many of us actually may have been really hurt or harmed through social media. Some of you may truly feel addicted to social media and the apps that you use. Some of you may have truly been impacted in your mental health and sense of self-esteem through the way that social media has affected you. And so if this is the case, just know that myself and my wife and uh, several of our volunteers will be spread across the room during this last worship song, and we would love just to pray with you and support you in any way we can. You know, at the end of the day, my hope is that this is a community where you don't feel shamed when you come in here, that this is a community where you don't feel like you have to hide what you're doing, where you don't feel like you have to be someone you're not, but that you can come into this community and know that this is a place where people love and care for you. And that helps you to experience the love and freedom that Jesus has for you. And so as you engage with social media, as you engage with technology, as you engage with the world around you, let us be a people of love. Let us be a people of kindness. Let us be a people who are not just complacent with the ways of this world, but is sharing the light and sharing a different way of living, a way of living that's rooted in the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we go back into worship. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for this time together. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you that you give us the ability to live transformed. We don't have to give in to the ways of this world, but you help us to be transformed in the ways of our mind, that we do not need to conform, but that we're renewed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, continue to transform us. Continue to help us be faithful to you. God, give us the strength. God, may this be a community where we can all come and find support, where we can come and just feel your love and feel the love from one another. May we be a community that shares love with others, where uh, we can be a light to the world around us, a light to Riverside and the world as a whole. May they know that the Grove Young Adults is a place of people who are just filled with people who are trying to be faithful disciples to Jesus. And we want to help others along the way too. Where we're not hiding the truth to ourselves and the light to ourselves, but that we're being beacons, that we're being witnesses for you. Help us in how we use social media, Lord. Help us to honor you in all that we do. And may we not find our validation and approval in a a like or a post, but God, may we find our validation and approval in our truest identity as children of you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace, Lord. Help us to live this out. In Jesus' name, amen.